Chinese and its cultural impact on today. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the surrounding eras. Because when you dedicate your life to history and the study of it, you come to realize nothing happens in a vacuum. So today, we are going to be exploring the extraordinary and breathtaking work of the Edwardian woman, the mothers and grandmothers of our most beloved flappers. Simply because, where would the flapper be without that earth-trembling work that the woman at the turn of the century did? And since the most iconic feature of the Edwardian woman is the crisp, smart, structured silhouette and a focus on projecting decorum at all times, I have decided to make one of the most fantastic pieces in her wardrobe. The walking skirt. With its feminine flaring style, obsession with clean lines, and just a little pop of fun with the pleating in the back, this is the perfect projection of fashionable orderliness of a refined society woman. However, as a 21st century woman who generally enjoys seeing her ankles, I am going to be modernizing it for my own lifestyles. And I will say, all the credit for this idea does go to the most beguiling Bernadette Banner, who is by far a much better seamstress than me, and I fully suggest that you go check out her channel. Because even though it is not a tutorial, you at least get to enjoy her fantastic sewing abilities. As for me, well, let's talk some history while I struggle to sew something for the first time in about nine years. If there are any seamstresses in the audience today, I will say I am deeply sorry. <laughs> The pattern I am using is the walking skirt from Truly Victorian, which is taken from the Metropolitan Pattern Company, originally published in 1898. Many members of my astute audience might notice that that makes this pattern older than the Edwardian era, which was between 1901 and 1910, and is named after the King of England at the time, King Edward. This actually makes the skirt a late Victorian style, but it is still incredibly popular in the following era because frankly, clothing is expensive and time consuming to make, so people wore them for many years. Many women even wore them into the 1920s, which creates a wonderful foil to the more scandalous flapper. For this project, I am using this glorious gray cotton tweed, which is unbelievably soft. It'll be lined with this soft pink cotton, which isn't the most historically accurate thing to do. Generally, you would like your lining to be the same color as your fashion fabric. However, this was the best feeling plain colored fabric I could find at the store. The pattern also needs a stiffener, so I picked up this green canvas. All of this is washed, dried, and ironed to prepare. While we iron, let's talk about the temperance movement. I spent a lot of time in my previous video covering everything leading up to Prohibition and the women who were prominent figures. This is because women are some of the most vulnerable to the negative effects of drinking culture in the 19th century America. This is before women's suffrage, and they are more often than not treated socially and legally as extensions of the men in their lives, rather than their own identity. Entire communities of women could fall victim to physical, sexual, emotional, and economic abuse fueled by alcohol. Women aren't allowed into the saloons, unless they were prostitutes, so there really isn't much love lost when people talk about closing them down. Contemporary accounts bristle with this almost firework-like energy about the trepidations, fears, frustrations, and anger surrounding alcohol. All of this just needs the smallest spark to set the passions aflame. Now, with everything nicely ironed, I'm cutting into my pattern pieces. Now the instructions for the skirt have you measure out your hip and waist size to find your pattern size. My measurements bridge between two different sizes, so I opt to use the larger pattern and I'll have to make edits as we go along. So while I sit on the floor for ages, cutting out all of the pattern pieces and fabric, let's talk about Ohio and the women's crusade. Ohio is the birthplace of many of the most powerful early women's movements, especially when it comes to temperance. Now, why is this all starting off in the Buckeye State? I'm not certain, but from what I can gather from my research, it comes down to religion. In 2014, surveys showed that 54% of the population was Protestant, and I'm sure that the numbers are even higher back in the 1800s. As for the importance of religious affiliation, I will have to leave that deep dive for another video. 
But for now, just know that temperance movement is deeply rooted in religion, particularly Protestant religious movements. The Women's Crusade was centralized in Ohio, with a third of the prominent crusaders coming from the state. By the end of the movement, over 900 communities in 31 states would have their own crusades. It all starts in 1873. Diocletian Lewis, a traveling temperance leader, comes to Hillsboro, Ohio, and to a congregation where he delivers a story about his mother holding a protest of prayers outside of saloons, grocery stores, and other places that sold booze. As he told it, the women wouldn't leave until the owners promised to stop selling alcohol, and from his telling, he claimed that they were able to close down three locations. His story was inspiring, and by the end of the month, the town's women had appointed a leader, Eliza Jane Thompson, and were holding their own non-violent protests across town. Women would pick a location that sold alcohol. They would sit outside its doors all day, every day, loudly singing and praying until the owner either signed a document promising never to sell alcohol anymore or just closed down entirely. This is looking good. With all of the fabric cut out, the next step is having you loosely stitch each lining piece to the outer fashion fabric which you can do with large, loose hand stitching. This makes it so that when you go to sew it at the machine, you treat the fashion fabric and lining as one piece. At first, the movement seems to be working. Several companies do promise to either never sell alcohol again or just close down from the public pressure. Though as I stated in my previous video, there is a lot of resistance and ultimately the movement crumbles under the pressure it puts upon its own crusaders. When all of the women go home, all of the shops open up again. So all the hard work didn't have a lasting impact, and overall it seems to have failed as a movement. However, I'd say it was successful, but not in the way that they were expecting. What the Women's Crusade ultimately does is teach women an important lesson, that they can have an impact on the public sphere. By working together, they could make real change happen. Now, at the sewing machine, we'll start by stitching the center back seam using a half inch seam allowance and making sure to leave a nine inch gap from the waist of the skirt, which seems like a very large gap in a very private area. But do not worry, the placket added later will make sure our decency as a proper Edwardian lady of society is preserved. Next, we're going to press the seams and make sure that they lay beautifully flat. Then realize you've sewn everything wrong and need to start the heartbreaking practice of seam ripping them all apart again. While I do that, let's talk about one of the groups to spring up from the Women's Crusade, and that is the WCTU, which is the only major group to be led by women for women. A surprising departure from most temperance groups that were more than happy to have female members and exploit their hardship, but the women were never actually allowed to lead or even speak in meetings. So I had a bit of an issue sewing the placket onto the back of the skirt. As you can see, there's just this tiniest bit of fabric that I caught the very edge of. And of course, if you put any amount of tension on it, it starts to split, pulling away completely. To fix this, you will get to watch me now do my very first ever attempt at the back stitch by hand. So I know she doesn't look pretty, but she'll be useful. So we're going to keep her there and just make this all look a little nicer. I'm sure that there are cosplayers and dressmakers watching this thinking, oh good lord, take the needle away from her. The WCTU used a truly womanly way of handling the situation. Many of their members were former teachers and education reformers, so they actually used children to their advantage, both teaching children in school about the dangers of alcohol but also having mothers go to public spaces and say, if you will not keep yourself safe for you, and you will not keep yourself safe for me, keep yourself safe for my children. And putting a lot of pressure on drinkers to stop it for the health and safety of the children around them in their lives. Which, if you think about it, is a pretty ingenious method. Nobody really wants to go around talking about how they like to endanger children whether intentionally or unintentionally. So using these two methods, the WCT was able to tap into two huge political bodies that have never been used before. First, the women who would need to be mobilized to vote, but also children and using them as a political weapon of sorts to really push forward a political agenda. So let's talk about the public sphere. 
In feminist studies, there is this concept of two spheres, the public and the private, that life can be divided into. For instance, the home would be the private sphere, while an office place is a public sphere. Historically, men were supposed to be in charge of the public sphere, while women were keepers of the private sphere. This idea is the most blatantly on display with the conventions of the Victorian age, where women were literally deemed angels of the home. Unfortunately, being the angel of the home meant isolation is pretty much par for the course in the private sphere. Women of a middle class upbringing or higher were expected to stay home, which greatly reduced the chances of the woman having an extended social circle. This made mobilization, for political and social reasons, even more complicated when the issues were centered around women. You simply could not connect everyone like you could today. But times were changing, and so were the delineations between the public and private sphere. With the back of the skirt sorted out, I can now start sewing all of the side pieces together. This pattern is composed of gore shapes, which is essentially broad triangles, that give volume at the ankles while leaving the waist trim. After another quick bit of pressing, the hem is ready to be felled into place, but being careful to only catch the lining fabric so the stitches are invisible from the outside. Something I love about the Victorian Edwardian fashion sense is the attention to detail and their attempt to make every garment look like it miraculously just came into being, as few of stitches possible could be seen. With the dawn of World War I, millions of men and women are pulled into the battlefields of Europe. Here in America, once we joined the fight on April 6th of 1917, there were thousands of jobs traditionally held by men that were now needing to be filled. Women took up these jobs, being pulled from the home into the public sphere. This mobility made it easier to communicate, disseminate information, and rally around causes. Made even easier by the invention of technology like the telephone. The telephone, invented in 1876 by Alexander Graham Bell, was the first to enable people to talk directly to each other across large distances. It rapidly becomes indispensable in businesses, governments, and more importantly, the household. With phones coming into the modern American home, people could talk like they never had before. Ideas start to swirl, spread like wildfire amongst female circles. Ideas like women's right to vote, abuse in the home, medical care, and alcohol. Now the idea and their newfound mobility, women started to galvanize around those key political issues. With everything hemmed, we now get to the fun part, adding the back pleating. The pattern leaves it up to the dressmaker on how you would like to do them, either with a gather or with folded pleats. I opted to fold the pleats, since this is such an iconic part of the Edwardian dress, I really wanted them to be done well and look smart. So measuring out the distance and depth of each fold. Once I was happy, I pressed the waistband in half and pinned it to the skirt, sewing all of this down with a straight stitch. Just to be certain that the pleats stayed nice and crisp, I pressed those and then felled them into place, catching only the edge of the fabric to keep it as invisible as possible. Even with all of these ideas and a drive for movement in the political world, I don't want anybody to believe that prohibition and women who worked for it achieved their goal overnight. In fact, it took years. The first real big move didn't come until December 10th of 1913, when thousands of female members in the WCTU marched on Washington alongside men of the Anti-Saloon League. All of this was to show their support for the creation of a new federal amendment to declare alcohol illegal. By this time, the fight for prohibition was fully linked to women's suffrage. In 1853, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the Women's State Temperance Society in upstate New York. Stanton would even refer to alcohol as the, quote, unclean thing. In their opinion, the only way that prohibition would happen was if women were given the right to vote. The hem has several panels of stiffening fabric to help give volume to the bottom and give it a crisp, straight line and structured silhouette. All of this brilliantly made invisible again by the additional panel of lining fabric. The stiffener layer is straight stitched along the bottom of the skirt, then folded up and felled down to finish the hemming process. 
By 1918, the 18th Amendment, which made intoxicating liquor illegal, passed through Congress and was being spread to the states for ratification. To be official, they needed 36 states to sign on to the new amendment. On January 16th of 1919, Nebraska became the 36th state to ratify. By the end of it all, though, only two states didn't ratify the 18th Amendment. When the law took effect on January 17th of 1920, it was a huge victory for the women who drove the movement. A victory that was used to push them through for a second win on women's suffrage later that same year. With everything filled into place, I can now add the finishing touches, putting two hook and eye closures at the center back of the waist. And with that, we're done! I absolutely adore this skirt. It is honestly my new favorite article of clothing. I'm actually contemplating making multiple in the f future. There's a substantial quality to it. The amount of fabric and layers come together to give this skirt a bulk and durability that's really rare in most modern clothing. The tasteful silhouette even makes me feel as if I stand taller while in this skirt, ready to be respected and heard. And that's honestly the power of clothing, its ability to change how people see us and how we can see ourselves. Equality that will become even more apparent as we pull into the 1920s and women start to shorten their skirt, bob their hair, and have a whole new lease on life. So, that is all for this historical adventure. I hope these stories might inspire the next band of sharply dressed witty women, or at the very least, provide a bit of pleasurable company. So until the next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>